when it looks like defeat for our Lord who's hanging on the cross, in fact, this is the victory because the cross represents the supreme expression of divine mercy and love. The mystery of the Last Supper will be unveiled at the cross because there we will see the fourth cup, the fulfillment of the kingdom. The Eucharist, the Last Supper, and Calvary illuminate each other. They explain one another. By suffering out of love and obedience, Christ gave more to God, the Father, than what was required to compensate for all the sins of the human race. It is time for us as Catholics to lay hold of this by becoming faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's great to be with you. It's also great to be focusing this morning on the subject of the Holy Eucharist. My presentation is entitled, The Fourth Cup, Unveiling the Mystery of the Last Supper and the Cross, based upon a new book of mine. But I want to begin by hearkening back to an experience that I had decades ago when I was still an evangelical seminarian studying for the ministry, attending a Sunday service at my favorite congregation because the pastor also happened to be my Hebrew professor and Old Testament instructor. He was one of those rare birds who could just make the Bible sing. And there I was with my wife, Kimberly. We were there attending a Palm Sunday service. We just read the Passion narrative and we sat back to listen to what was ordinarily at least a 45 minute sermon. But in the middle of the sermon, I was struck by something that he did. Because in the middle of his message, he raised a simple question when we were going through verses in John 19, where Jesus says in verse 30, it is finished. And then he paused and we thought it was a dramatic pause. And he asked us, what do you think it refers to? And I thought, well, that's an effective rhetorical strategy until I began to realize along with everybody else, that he had interrupted himself and asked a question that he didn't know the answer to. And so as he just kind of looked out there, it is finished. I'm sitting there thinking, come on, it is our redemption. That's what's finished. And as he spoke again, he said, you know, if you're sitting there thinking that Jesus is speaking of his redemption that is finished, that can't be. Because as Paul points out in Romans 4.25, he was raised for our justification, and he's not resurrected yet. So it can't be our redemption. That would be premature. I'm not sure what it is, so let's just move on. And he did. He moved on, and everybody else moved with him except for me. I am sitting in the pew thinking to myself, you can't do that. You can't ask a question to which you don't know the answer. And so I'm not sure I heard another word that he said for the rest of that sermon, because what I began doing was looking at the passage there in John 19.30, it is finished, asking myself, what is finished? And by the time the sermon was done and we were leaving the service, I walked out, shook his hand at the back door and said, you can't do that. He said, do what? Ask a question and then not answer it. He laughed, he said, funny guy, I'm sure you'll find the answer and let me know. Well, I took that as a personal challenge as well as an invitation. And so after lunch, I spent the rest of the afternoon buried in my books. I wanted to find an answer to the question, what was Jesus talking about when he said, it is finished? And so of course, whenever you're looking at a text that is perplexing, you have to back up and look at it in context. And so what I noticed is what many others have noticed, and that is everything that is happening to our Lord in John 19 is happening in the context of the Passover feast. And so I spent most of that afternoon immersing myself in the historical context, the background of the Passover. And of course, this was a memorial feast that the Jews celebrated on the 14th of Nisan. And you know, a little bit of study shows you that it's almost impossible for Gentile Christians to appreciate the significance of Passover for first century Jews. I mean, it would almost be like Christmas, Easter, and the 4th of July all rolled into one. 
And why? Because when you go back to the fateful night described in Exodus 12, you can see the tenth and final sign that God has given to Moses for Israel's salvation is the Passover. The instructions are given there that every Israelite family is to take a lamb, an unblemished male lamb, slaughter the lamb, and then with a hyssop branch, sprinkle the blood on the doorposts. And then, of course, after you have done that, you proceed to roast that lamb, and then you gather as a family, standing around the table, standing, not sitting, because you are ready to flee to freedom under the leadership of Moses, under the power of God, but you eat that lamb. And the meal itself is the climax of the sacrifice. And my study also led me to work on the notion of Passover as the sacrifice and communion meal that sealed the covenant bond between the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Israelites there in Egypt. And so you can see that a covenant is a blood bond that establishes family communion. In this case, it restores that between the Lord God and his people. And so these liturgical feasts like Passover were intended to signify and strengthen these bonds of family communion as well as to renew the covenant. And this was an important part of the legacy of Israelite faith. For us to understand what Jesus and his fellow disciples and all of the other Jews were doing there on the 14th of Nisan, you really have to understand this notion of Passover in the light of the covenant. And so I began to realize that the entire succession of events leading up to the crucifixion were basically narrated in the context of the Passover. So for example, we see that the day of preparation in John 18 is precisely when he is standing before Pilate, sentenced to die. It was about the sixth hour, we read. And John, the evangelist, realized, of course, that the sixth hour was precisely the time that the priests were prescribed to begin slaughtering the lambs for the Passover. How significant that was the moment when Jesus was sentenced to die. And likewise, the identification of Jesus on the cross with the Passover lamb is brought out by John also because he's the only one standing there, the beloved disciple. He's the only one who noticed that while the thieves' legs were broken to expedite their deaths, Jesus was already dead. So his bones were not broken, thus to fulfill the scripture we read in John 19, 33 to 36, not a bone of him shall be broken. Going right back to Exodus 12, 46, where Moses had prescribed that the sacrificial lamb could not have any broken bones. Another link is found in the fact that you have in John 19, 29, that the bowl full of sour wine that stood there was put on a sponge and lifted up on a hyssop branch. Now the other evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, notice that they offered him a drink of sour wine, but they don't tell us whether he drank it or not. Only John tells us because only John was there. And so you can see the hyssop branch for John's narrative is significant because once again in Exodus 12, 22, it was the hyssop branch that was prescribed to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of the Israelite households. John apparently notices another detail. In John 19, 23, we hear about the soldiers drawing lots for his seamless linen garment. The word in Greek for garment, I notice, kiton, is the same term used to describe the liturgical vestment worn by the high priest when he offered the sacrifice. So this alerts us to the fact that Jesus is here in the context of the Passover wearing, in effect, what the high priest would wear while he's also suffering what the Passover lamb would suffer. Without any broken bones, he is offered up. And all of this for me was fascinating. Dinner came and I spent the rest of the evening studying more about this. But I realized at the end of the day, I hadn't found an answer. This was much more involved than I realized. And so in addition to my schoolwork, I was trying to find spare time in the evening to go a little bit deeper. Because I realized that the Passover back in ancient Egypt, as you read in Exodus 12, is not the whole story. I realized that you also have to kind of contextualize the Passover so that I 
would understand how it was celebrated by first century Jews like Jesus and his disciples. And so a little bit of research, I found this rabbi who taught at Oxford University in England, Rabbi David Dalby, among others. And all of them pointed out that the Passover meal, as it was celebrated in the first century by Jews, consisted of four parts. And it was easy to identify the sequence of parts because there were four cups. First, the preliminary course consisted of a festival blessing, Kedush in the Hebrew. And Kedush, of course, means sanctification. And so the Kedush cup was the first to be shared by all of the celebrants. And as soon as the Kedush cup, the cup of sanctification, was passed around and shared, they all also partook of bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. And this moved into the second course, which included the recital of the Passover narrative, the Haggadah, along with the singing of the little Hillel, Psalm 113, followed by the second cup being shared, which was, of course, the Hillel cup, the cup of praise. And so what you have here at this moment is the transition into the main course, which is the third part of this. And so after the Haggadah cup or the Hillel cup, you then proceed to the main course, at the end of which you share this cup of Barakah, the cup of blessing. And so after the third cup, the cup of blessing is shared, Rabbi Dalby, again, and other scholars too, pointed out to me that you've reached now the climax of the Passover, or what we might call the Seder meal. And so the Passover would climax after the third cup was shared with the singing of the great Hallel. Hallel, of course, in Hebrew means praise. And so the great Hallel consists of Psalms 114, 115, 116, 117, and 118. And then, of course, you have come to the culminating point, and that is the fourth cup. And so you would drink this fourth cup, the cup of consummation, some call it, except that that's not what happened. When you look into this, the scholarship shows you what it showed me, that the pattern that is narrated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke clearly reflects this Passover structure. For example, in Luke 22, you can hear Luke describe at least two cups that are shared. The second of them is probably the cup of blessing, which was the third cup of the meal. Scholars readily identify this, and then also notice that after Jesus consecrates the third cup, the cup of blessing, we read, and when they sang a hymn in Mark 14, 26. And I notice the scholars all pinpoint this as the moment of transition where you go from the third cup to the fourth cup because the hymn is the great Hallel. Indeed, Paul identifies the Eucharistic cup in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, as the cup of blessing. Now, where in the world did he find that terminology? Well, I hadn't noticed that until I'm looking into the first century Passover, the way first century Jews celebrated, and Paul is, of course, referring to the third cup of the Passover, the cup that Jesus consecrated. But at this point, a significant problem arose in my research because Jesus, instead of proceeding immediately to the climax, the drinking of the fourth cup, instead we read in Mark 14, 26, and when they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, close quote. Now, it might seem difficult for Gentile Christians like you and me, who are not familiar with the Haggadah, the Passover liturgy, to perceive what a serious disorder in the sequence this represents. But it's not lost to Jewish readers who are looking at the gospel the way Rabbi David Dalby did. For them, Jesus is skipping the fourth cup. I have photocopied here a page from his book, The New Testament and Rabbinic Judaism, published back in 1956, which I was reading that night. And so, of the four cups of wine prescribed for the Passover Eve service, the third over which grace is said is to be taken immediately after the supper. According to the synoptics and Paul, this third cup is the cup of the new covenant. Paul actually adapts its technical designation. Leave it to a rabbi to notice these details. There is, however, in Matthew and Mark, a reference also to the fourth and last cup of the Passover liturgy. It is contained in the words that Jesus spoke. I will not drink henceforth 
of this fruit of the vine until I drink it new in my Father's kingdom or in the kingdom of God. The meaning to Rabbi Dalby is clear. The fourth cup will not be taken, at least at the normal time. Now, you know, it's striking to me that these are details that I never noticed. But then, of course, if you invited a Jewish friend to attend a Sunday Mass, and you were sitting there with him, and for whatever reason, this elderly priest pronounced the words of consecration, but then forgot the rite of communion and proceeded to the benediction, would you notice as a Catholic? Well, of course. Would your Jewish friend notice? Of course not. But in fact, for us, communion is sort of the climax of the Eucharistic liturgy. Well, likewise, the fourth cup is the climax of the Passover liturgy. And so to skip this is no small omission. Now, scholars who notice this problem, I discovered over the course of more study, over the course of weeks, are asking the question, why did he skip it? Well, it's almost as though the goal of the Passover was missed. So I noticed that Jesus says this important statement. I say to you, I shall not drink it again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom. It's almost as though Jesus was alerting his disciples that he was not going to drink what they were expecting him to drink and share with them. A couple scholars I found speculated that psychological factors might account for Jesus' forgetfulness. They point out how subsequently we read in Mark 14, 32, he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Perhaps our Lord was just too upset to be bothered with liturgical precision in following the rubrics. Well, that kind of analysis might seem plausible, Further reflection led me to think that it's highly unlikely. For one thing, if Jesus is so distracted and confused, it seems doubtful that he would forget and interrupt the Passover liturgy, expressly declaring his intention not to drink the fourth cup, especially since he goes ahead anyway and sings the great Hallel. Why would he declare himself so plainly before acting in such a disorderly manner? All of his other actions that night struck me as a man admittedly distressed, but in full possession of himself. So then the question remained, why then did he choose not to drink? I hadn't found an answer, and it was weeks after Palm Sunday, but I was continuing my search up until the time I was getting ready for graduation from seminary. This is when I was led to a third stage in my own research. The third stage basically leads me to something obvious. When they went out to the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane, notice what Jesus prays, not once or twice, but three times. We read in Matthew 26, going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Three times he prays to his father, Abba, Father, for him to take away this cup. Now, an obvious question arises, what cup is Jesus speaking of? Well, I looked at the commentaries, and some of them speculated that this could be a reference to Isaiah 51, 17, or Jeremiah 25, 15, where we read about the cup of God's wrath being drunk all the way down to the bottom, to the dregs. And perhaps there is a connection to Isaiah and Jeremiah but it seems less direct than the primary link suggested by the overall Passover setting, especially when you notice that he drank the third but skipped the fourth and went out to pray three times, take away this cup, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And notice also how Jesus states his resolution that he's not going to taste of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom is coming, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. And it's interesting, too, because what I noticed there in Mark 15, 23, is that on the way up to Golgotha, what did they offer him? Wine mingled with myrrh. And he refused it. Well, no wonder, because he had pledged not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until it was fulfilled in the kingdom. So what does that mean, fulfilled in the kingdom? On the surface, we would expect it to be sort of pointing to the second coming when the kingdom of God's glory is finally manifested. 
But this is when I went back to John's gospel and I discovered a fourth and final clue. And that is how John depicts the kingdom is different than how Matthew, Mark, and Luke present it. Of course, we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. About 80% of what they share is in common, whereas John's gospel is clearly distinct. I would propose that John's gospel is not in any way contradictory, but complementary. That there is something deliberately symphonic and supplemental about what John is doing. For example, when John has Jesus coming out of the garden and the soldiers are getting ready to arrest him, Peter draws the sword and John notices that he cuts off Malchus's ear, which Jesus heals as his last miracle before his passion. And then John adds what the other evangelists don't mention, and that is he turns to Peter and says, shall I not drink of the cup which my father has willed? Now that's significant because John doesn't have the cup sayings in the Gethsemane prayer. John doesn't even have the details about the cups in the upper room. And so John is clearly signaling to his reader that they know the synoptic tradition, and now I'm sort of perhaps because Jesus knows that he must drink the cup willed by the Father. But when I continued reading John's gospel, I discovered this element that scholars refer to as Johannine irony. That irony is throughout John's gospel. Well, what is irony? Irony is sort of when you get the opposite of what you expect. And so when you think about what it means for Jesus to fulfill the plan of God in the covenant, for the kingdom of God to be fully manifested, John shows us a different perspective. Because in John chapter 12, we read that when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself, casting out the prince of this world. This he said to show what? How he would come again and defeat Satan at the end of time? No, John adds, this he said to show by what death he was to die. So in typical Johannine fashion, John is showing us that the moment when Satan seems to triumph is in fact when Satan is being defeated. And at that same moment when it looks like defeat for our Lord who's hanging on the cross, in fact, this is the victory. When the prince of this world is cast out, when all men will be drawn to himself. And why? Because the cross represents the supreme expression of divine mercy and love. So he's not losing his life there at Calvary as much as he is making it a gift of love. And love is the essential force of the kingdom of God. And it is at that moment when the kingdom is truly being fulfilled from John's perspective. So months into my research, I'm sort of gathering up the fragments, you might say, because I am curious to figure out, okay, okay exactly where have I been? What ground have I covered? The first thing I recalled was the Passover back in Exodus, how it was the first time around. The second step was looking at the Passover liturgy, the way first century Jews like Jesus would have celebrated it. And then the third stage was noticing the prayer in Gethsemane where Jesus prays three times for the Father to take away this cup and then he gives heartfelt consent to drinking it all. And then this fourth and final element showed me that from John's perspective, the triumph of Jesus' purpose, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, does not come at the end of time, nor is it associated just with the resurrection. In fact, it is when the Son of Man is lifted up, drawing all to himself, casting out the prince of this world. And so there I was, going back again to the fourth gospel. Because only in the gospel of John do we read about what happened when they offered him the sour wine. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, once again, you hear that they offered him the wine. And if that's all we had were the three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'd probably conclude that he didn't drink it because after all, on the way to Golgotha, he re refused the wine. But once again, only John tells us what he did because only John is there as an eyewitness. And so in John 19, let's go back and reread verses 28 to 30. We read, a bowl full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, that's when he says, it is finished. 
And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In a moment, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I realized that I'd found the answer to my question. The it that was finished was the Passover liturgy that he had begun with the disciples in the upper room and then interrupted. And why? Because more precisely, the it that was finished was not simply the Passover of the old covenant, but Jesus' fulfillment of that and its transformation of the Passover of the old covenant into the Passover sacrifice of the new covenant. And so that's when he drinks the third cup, skips the fourth, goes to Gethsemane, and then up to Golgotha, and manifests the supremacy of God in life-giving love by dying on the cross. Not losing, but rather giving his life. So what about that fourth cup? Precisely at the moment of his death, he drinks from the bowl of sour wine and partakes of the fourth cup. And once again, ironically, the hour of Jesus' crucifixion and death constitutes no defeat. Rather, this is the hour that he manifests the glory of the kingdom and enters into paradise with that thief, just as he said he would. So I had come to realize that Scripture teaches that the Passover sacrifice of the new covenant actually begins in the upper room while he's celebrating the Passover, in the context of which he institutes the Eucharist that we are so much more familiar with than first century Jews, than we would be with the Passover. I also came to realize that this Passover sacrifice of the lamb in the old is now being fulfilled by the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. The sacrifice did not begin at Calvary. It began in the upper room. And the Passover was not complete when they went out to the Mount of Olives. Rather, the Passover is complete precisely there on Calvary. It didn't occur to me at the time that this matched or corresponded perfectly with what the Catholic Church teaches. I was still anti-Catholic in my general outlook. I was now an evangelical Presbyterian minister, and I had never read a single Catholic theologian or an account of the Mass, nor had I attended Mass, nor did I ever want to, because for us, the Mass was re-sacrificing Jesus, and it constituted sacrilege, if not blasphemy. And so, here I was, one evening, teaching a course at a local seminary. And I had about a dozen seminarians, and I'm going through the material in the Gospel of John as well as the Synoptic Gospels, raising the question to them, what does Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? What was finished? And sure enough, there was an answer. Our redemption. Nope. Romans 4.25, he is raised for our justification, and that hasn't happened yet. So they're looking at me, wondering, what other answer is there? And so I walked them through the steps. And as I got to the end, I shared with them what I had discovered on my own, or so I thought, that the only way to really understand the meaning of Jesus' words or the mystery of what happened there at Golgotha is by backing up and looking at Calvary in the light of the upper room, the Passover, the Eucharist, the transformation of the old into the new, and then the prayer where he gives heartfelt consent to the Father's will to drink the cup, which he doesn't drink until he sees that it is all finished. And then he declares that solemn phrase, it is finished, which is sort of like the cup of consummation. And so as I was wrapping up the lecture, I sort of asked them, I want you to think about the following before our class next week. When did Jesus' sacrifice begin? Was it at Calvary? And this kid in the back row raised his hand. And I said, think about it a week. You have some time. But he began to wave it. And then he groaning, oh, oh, oh. Well, whenever that happens, that's sort of what the, the bane of an instructor's existence is, you know. Because reluctantly, you have to call on him. And, and so John said, it's clear that the sacrifice didn't begin on Good Friday at Calvary. It began on Holy Thursday in the upper room. And I said, okay, you can see the link. Then I want you to spend the week thinking about this. When does the Passover of the new covenant reach its climax? And his hand was up again a second time. Come on now, John, think about it for a week. And he is moaning and groaning again so reluctantly. What is it now? He said, well, it's obvious too that the Passover sacrifice 
begun in the Passover in the upper room, it didn't end until Calvary. And I'm like, okay, so you can see that the Eucharist, the Last Supper, and Calvary, Jesus' crucifixion, basically illuminate each other. They explain one another. They're mutually interpretive. You can't understand either one without the other because they're one in the same sacrifice. And then his hand went up a third time. And I'm thinking, that wasn't a question. <laughs> and so once again, with some reluctance, I said, what is it now? He said, that's exactly what I learned when I was a kid growing up studying the, the Baltimore Catechism. And I looked at him, you mean the Westminster Catechism? I never heard of the Baltimore Catechism, much less read it. And what the Westminster Catechism is what we used as Presbyterians. He said, no, I was raised Catholic and the nuns in school used the Baltimore Catechism to teach us and that's what they taught us. And I remember just thinking to myself as I'm mopping the sweat from my brow, I'm in trouble, you know, and I'm like, I don't think that's the case. And he said, you ought to look into it. <laughs> well, funny thing, because the next week I did look into it. I found me an old battered copy of the Baltimore Catechism and sure enough, it's exactly what the Baltimore Catechism taught. And at that moment, I realized I was venturing out into troubled waters because I didn't want to teach anything that was Catholic, but I also didn't want in any way to just give in to fear and turn away from the scriptures and to kind of sin against the light.